Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Chris Agard, and I'm one of your three AF fellows. In recent elections, suburban congressional districts across the country have observed shifts from red to purple to even blue. Even the suburbs of Dallas, Texas, are not immune to this phenomenon. The state's 24th congressional district, wedged in between Dallas and Fort Worth, has been represented by a Republican since 2004. In 2020, Candace Valenzuela sought to change and change that and came within a hair of doing so, losing the seat by less than 5,000 votes. Built on a diverse and inclusive grassroots movement, Ms. Valenzuela tests the limits of political possibilities in a traditionally Republic Tex Republican Texan district. Today, she joins us to discuss her political career and mission. Candace Valenzuela, Claremont McKenna College, class of 2006, is an educator turned politician from Texas. She first ran for office in 2017, becoming the first Afro-Latina to serve on the Carrollton Farmers Branch Independent School District Board in Texas, defeating an 18-year incumbent. In office, she has been an advocate for greater fiscal transparency and worked to expand STEM education, vocational training, and coding academies in district schools. She has also pushed for funding for school renovations and focused on making sure the district is inclusive and welcoming to students of all backgrounds. Prior to politics, she pursued work in education, including mentoring youth, tutoring, and working with special needs students. Ms. Valenzuela and her husband, Andy, live in Dallas with their two children, who inspired her to enter politics. Ms. Valenzuela will be in conversation with Victoria Johnson and Anna Green, Claremont McKenna Seniors, and host of the podcast, Free Food for Thought. Using the Q&A function, we will accept questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send in a question, please state your affiliation with the college student, faculty, parent, alumni, friend. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Ms. Valenzuela is the featured speaker for the 2021 Women in Leadership Workshop. The workshop is a joint partnership of the Women in Leadership Alliance, the Berger Institute for Individual and Social Development, the Kravis Leadership Institute, and the Magrublian Center for Human Rights, all at, the, all at Claremont McKenna College. Finally, the WLA, presentation is generously supported by Tom Hanley, CMC class of 1997, and his wife, Susan Hanley. Please join me in welcoming Candace Valenzuela to the Athenaeum. Thank you so much, Chris. Hey, everyone. This is Free Food for Thought, a student-run, student-focused podcast here to feed your curiosity. My name is Tori Johnson. I am a senior at CMC and I am one of the co-directors of the podcast. And my name is Anna. I'm also a senior at CMC and I'm Tori's counterpart in directing the podcast. For those who are not familiar with our podcast, Free Food for Thought gives listeners a behind the scenes look at the experiences and instances that shaped influential people. As Chris mentioned, this interview is part of the 2021 Women and Leadership Workshop, and there is no one better suited to speak to this year's theme of representation and responsible leadership than our guest, Candace Valenzuela. As Chris also mentioned, Candace was most recently a candidate for the U.S. House in Texas's 24th District. We are so excited to be speaking with her today and recording a live episode of our podcast. Thank you so much for joining us, Candace. <laughs> It's so, great to be here. To begin, we would be remiss not to discuss the fact that we are speaking with a CMC alumna. So bringing it back a little bit, would you mind telling us a little bit about your experience at CMC? What made you decide to major in government? Well, you know, my, my experience at CMC was well, it was beautiful and challenging and all kinds of things wrapped into one. And it just felt very natural for me to go into government. Uh, just going back a little bit, both my mom and dad were in the military. Um, both my grandfathers were in the military. Both my great grandfathers were in the military. And so, so much of what happened at the federal level affected my uh, military town, El Paso, just 
just by Fort Bliss uh, affected the way in which uh, my family interacted and they were very, very engaged. So from a young age, we were always talking about what the president was doing, what folks were saying. And so when I got to CMC, I didn't think of myself necessarily as a gov major, but I had one of my very first talks with Professor Scary, and uh, he's not there now, uh, but he looked at me and said, you know, the way that you talk about El Paso, the way that you talk about Texas, uh, the way that you talk about um, injustice, it, it, you just kind of scream government major. <laughs> and I, I took that in for a bit. And I think there was a little bit of a reluctance to, to really embrace it. Uh, because for my mom and dad, they didn't have a college education. Uh, they thought of, of government and politics as being uh, narcissistic, a little flighty, not very practical for their kid. Uh, but the more I, I found myself in discourse, the more I found myself in classes, the more it just felt right. And that's how I, I it came to my uneasy decision to be a gov major. <laughs> That is very, I think, very relatable as a government major. Um, as college students, even in the liberal arts setting that we have at CMC, we can sometimes feel uh, like pressured to work in the field that we major in or major in the field that we intend to work in. Um, so we wanted to know what made you decide to work in education after college um, and how that ultimately shaped your decision to run for the Carrollton Farmers uh, Branch School Board. I would have to say that the way in which I, I got away from my major, it, it started off being intentional and then became extraordinary good luck. And I also, at the same time, don't necessarily wish that good luck on this generation of students. And you'll see why in a moment. So when I graduated from college, I ended up working of my own volition at a girls group home. I was working with kids that were between the ages of 12 and 18. They were they were either uh, too rambunctious for foster care is probably one of the best ways of putting it, or they were exceptionally behaved during probation. And so they were, pu they were put into this facility. And I went from, uh, you know, snack every, uh, snack every weeknight and having somebody take out my trash to suddenly being the 22 year old parent of, you know, people age ranging from age 12, ages 12 to 19. I felt very compelled to give back because I felt so grateful for the fact that my CMC education was paid for, uh, that folks thought of me and I, I wanted to spend time working in the community. But when it came time, uh, my year was up, I wanted to work in my major, the recession had hit hard and a lot of folks were fleeing the private sector into the public sector and suddenly all of those jobs that were considered entry level were suddenly requiring five years of work experience. And five years prior to that, I wasn't even an adult, I was a minor. So it was great luck that I, I ended up again, working in one job. And then I had to put another job on top of that at the same time. And then another job on top of that at the same time. And as a young woman of color, I ended up working in a place where people love seeing young women of color. I ended up working with kids. And so I went into boutique tutoring. I was working with kids as young as five, all the way to adults as old as 55, and everything from mainstream schooling to basic literacy to being able to speak English so that they could better talk with their, their kids' teachers. I took school photos. I uh, was at one point the, the teacher of a video games and society class at a charter school, and that was a lot of fun. I did all of these things that placed me at the crux of many education debates. And in my mind, it was something that I was doing, well, one, because I did have an interest in, 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 in kids and, and families, but it was also something that I was doing to survive. And a lot of those times as I was experiencing this nonlinear path, as I was experiencing the economy as it existed then, I thought, oh my goodness, did I, did I mess up in those four years? Was my mom right? <laughs> and it, it turns out that all of that time 
came to a head when I, I ended up moving back to Texas. And uh, just a little side note, my husband's a Texan. And we had, and now I, I can actually tell you this and you'll understand this. We had a, a uh, we had a 15 romance, meaning we had a romance along the 15. I was in Laverne area and my husband was in uh, San Diego by S San Diego State University. And we would go on dates in Temecula from time to time. And eventually, you know, we hit it off, we got married, and he said, by law, we had to move back to Texas in order to have other Texans. And as a Texan, that's sound and reasonable logic. So we ended up back here. And for a number of reasons, uh, you, you know, this was post-Trump getting elected. I was looking at our, our school systems and, and looking at how it was lacking in representation the way that I was looking at our Congress much later on. And I didn't see myself as somebody who would run for office, but as I was looking at the specific office uh, that was focused on uh, the, the futures of, of children and families and the communities, as I was thinking of my, my 10 years of, of, of education experience at that point and my time at CMC, uh, it was just a perfect storm uh, for me to, to run for an office. I knew even if I'd lost, I was, I was going for some place where I would be able to do good. I was going after an office that I would be able to, to bring awareness to a lot of situations that many families were facing. And it just happened to go exceptionally well after that. Thank you for sharing so much about your background that we may not have seen publicly beforehand. Um, but pivoting a little bit to politics, can you tell us about what moment leading up to the 2020 campaign cycle was it when you knew you wanted to run for office? Oof. So after I was on the board, you know, I defeated an 18 year Republican incumbent uh, to get on this board and, and represent the families as they existed in, in this district. Uh, it's a suburban uh, majority person of color, majority at risk youth district, a lot like me uh, and the way that I, I'd grown up. And I, I had this very long plan. I had all of these things that I wanted to accomplish. And, you know, a couple of things happened. One, I ended up hiring a new superintendent and he shared a lot of my concerns uh, surrounding equity and special needs students and making sure that, that kids eat and have access to the technology that they need regardless of their incomes. And so that was one thing that uh, took my tenure plan down a couple of notches and, 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 and shortened my timeline a little. But the other thing that was really weighing on me was a lot of the conditions that my kids were living in, a lot of the conditions that my teachers were living in. I had multiple teachers just putting in hours and hours of their time, putting in executive level work. I mean, I have never been more impressed with a fourth grade teacher than I am today in this environment right now. They, they do so much. I had principals that would come in at seven in the morning so that they could tutor kids. And then they would throughout the day help to assist teachers to teach kids when people didn't show up. And then in the afternoons, they would tutor kids and then they would get to do their administrative work. And so regularly I would be seeing my principals putting in insane weeks and all the while, kids are starting to bounce around from place to place more than I did. And I, I was itinerant. I don't want to say itinerant, but I, I was housing insecure. Uh, by the time I was in second grade, I was at four different elementary schools. And when you switch a kid like that, their chances for success decreases pretty significantly. So I'm watching all of these systemic factors happen. And I'm still not thinking I'm going to run for Congress. And we're at the end of the 2018 election cycle. Uh, I had just gotten my $300 million bond package passed, and I was very excited about what that would be doing for facilities for kids. And I go to lunch with folks, uh, some of whom had worked on a prominent Texas senatorial campaign. I don't need to name who it is. Um, and I am pregnant. And I don't mean like cute maternity photos where you put the little shoes on your belly or you make the little heart shape on your belly kind of pregnant. No, 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 no. I was the, for the love of God, 
I hope that I can find a t-shirt in my husband's drawer that will fit me tomorrow because otherwise I will have no clothes kind of pregnant. And I'm sitting at lunch with these people I think are my friends. And they say, you know, Texas 24 almost flipped this cycle. I said, yes. They said, you know who would flip this district? A strong woman of color. And I said, I cannot wait to help you find her. And I kept eating and I was the only one eating. And I told them they were crazy. They were out of their minds to insinuate that I should be running for a, a, a for Congress. I, that was not at all where I was looking. I was very happy with my office where it was. I still had plans. And I went home and I told my husband, you know, this crazy thing happened. My friend said, you know, you should run for Congress. And he said, that makes a lot of sense. I think, you, I think they're right. And I told them that he was out of his mind. And even more so because at that point, he's signing up to take on a lot of responsibilities. We had a three and a half year old son and a baby on the way. And he said, you know, just think about it. And of course, I didn't want to think about it. I actually waddled my incredibly pregnant self to various elected officials offices and said, you know, this would be a great thing for you to do. And they said, I thought you were coming here to tell me you were going to run for Congress. I said, absolutely not. I was coming to encourage you. And they said, no, I think you should do it. And I still was not going to go along with it. And women, this is actually not very unusual. Women need to be asked multiple times to run for office. And it wasn't the asking that really did it for me. It probably helped nudge me. But when I was going forward into 2019, uh, even holding a new baby in my arms and, and recovering from what all that entails, I was watching the field develop, develop on the Democratic side. And I did not see anybody step into the field that understood what my families were going through when they were trying to make ends meet. Uh, didn't understand the feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach when you're trying to make sure that you can pay for your rent and maybe your transmission and maybe your food. And one of those might have to drop and you don't know which one it is at this point. And this was what a lot of my families were going through, even though they'd gone through and done everything right. They've crossed their T's, they've dotted their I's. Many of them were well-educated, but still finding themselves at the food bank. And this was before COVID. And so with a four month old and a three and a half year old, I announced my, my candidacy for, for United States Congress. Wow, that, I mean, being a candidate is hard enough. That is absolutely incredible. Um, as you kind of just touched on, your background story and really your whole life were messages that you put at the forefront of your campaign. Um, and talking about very sensitive topics like housing insecurity and being the first person in your family to go to college. I'd love to know what it was like sharing those stories. Were you ever afraid to bring those up as part of your campaign? And was it ever um, traumatic to be frequently recounting those when pitching yourself as a candidate? That's a, that's a very good question. And it was something I, I, I had to grapple with for a while. So let me give you a little insidery information about how people start off their campaigns. At one point, every candidate running a serious campaign will do this thing called a bio call. And part of the purpose, it's multi-purpose, part of the purpose of a bio call is so they can figure out all of the dirt so that they can figure out how to pivot around the dirt if the dirt ever comes back to, to haunt you in your, your political life. But the other thing was to just see what accomplishments you might have that you might not have been thinking of. And women are very good at not thinking about their accomplishments as being accomplishments. And so I got on the phone with um, you know, a lot of consultants and staff members and uh, you know, my one finance director, he was the only person who was on the ground with me. And I said, okay, I don't really particularly wanna share my entire life story with these folks, but these folks are here to protect me. Uh, these folks are here to help me run the best campaign I can. And so let's, let's do this, let's go. And so I got a glass of water and I started from the very beginning talking about the fact that I was uh, about three and a half years old and my my brother my little brother was still in diapers and we left domestic violence and I was homeless 
uh, living in a kiddie pool outside of a gas station. And that just rolls out of my mouth now. But it wasn't even something I thought of as being significant. For me, in my experience, homelessness just felt like it was a part of so many people's stories. Uh, for me, in my experience, abuse just feels like it's a part of so many people's stories. And it was it never even crossed my mind as I was saying these things. It was just a part of a sequence of events in my life that it would suddenly become a, a viral video ad for my congressional campaign. I never thought that that would happen. And I had to grapple with that uh, before making it. I had to ask myself, is this what is good for that child, that child who is in that very vulnerable and, and, and delicate position? And the conclusion I ultimately came to was that as much as I'd suffered, I'd also had great policies that had helped me to, to get out of that suffering as much as possible. Housing through HUD, uh, we had food stamps and, and public education. Policymakers had to put those things in place because families couldn't go through things. And my story, was supposed to be the vehicle for for helping other families, uh, for helping children who were vulnerable like me. And you know, at that point, we were at the height of of putting babies in cages. We you know we've got a couple of thousand, maybe more, uh, children who have been separated from their parents, and it hurt so much that I was willing to do whatever it took to get into office to help change policies that don't keep fam families in mind first. Thank you. Um, so the next question we'd like to ask is that um, you've spoken a lot about your background and some of these formative experiences that shaped your campaign. But I'm curious to learn a little bit about what didn't make the forefront of your messaging. What books or concepts or thinkers maybe influenced your campaign? There's not a lot of space in a campaign to talk about Aristotle. <laughs> there's, 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 and there's, there's not a lot of space. I mean, I, I, I think about campaigning and governance. Uh, so much through the lessons that I got through it, got at CMC. I, I took a, the uh, political philosophy with Mark Blitz and then ended up taking statesmanship and leadership with him too. And so much of that, I, again, never thought for years that I would ever be thinking about those things again. And I was thinking about it very critically when I was looking at, um, when I was looking at governments, governance on my school board. Uh, and, and looking at, uh, you know, what the combination of my experiences and, and the knowledge that I brought from my, my work and from my schooling brought, uh, did not have a lot of opportunity to talk about my friend in the background here as well. I have a, uh, a painting of, of James Baldwin, uh, and I uh, was just so fortunate uh, to be introduced to James Baldwin um, in, in, uh, at CMC and Adam, I cannot remember his last name right now. And I am Adam Bradley, professor Adam Bradley, uh, taught this incredible black literature class at CMC and Baldwin and his very frank, but loving discussion about America as very frank, but loving discussion about race and how we interacted in this country very deeply spoke to me. And I think a lot about how much knowledge uh, we get from folks that, that have an openness to uh, looking at, at some of the, the wounds that we have in our country in, in, in order to heal them. And also how much and how, or how little has changed since the 1960s. And it's very unfortunate, but I know in my political life that Inertia isn't going to solve our problems. People uh, moving by themselves isn't going to solve our problems. We have to do the work if we want to see peace and equity in this country. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm taking on myself. Yes, I wish that our listeners could see, and I'm so glad that we can see your background because it's such a lovely way of 
um, providing tribute to things that influence you. And I see the CMC pendant in the back as well. Um, so the past few election cycles, we've seen historic numbers of women and people of color running for office, but recent data suggests that these trends towards making Congress look more like America are not really reflected in campaign and Hill staff. I know that this is something that was very important to you, and I was wondering if you could speak um, to what you observed on your campaign when you hired staffers uh, and what kind of structural changes you believe are necessary to fix this problem. Thank you so much for asking that, Anna. And it was incredibly important to me to have a staff that reflected my district. Again, my district was a suburban, well-educated, majority person of color district. And when you think about a candidate, they're not just the person that you put up in front. Uh, so much of their messaging, so much of, of their governance depends on the people that they depend on around them, right? And in my search for, for people of color from this area, it was very difficult for one thing, running as a Democrat, democratic politics and, and uh, the work area had been gutted over the last couple of decades. And so hiring from within this state uh, was a little bit difficult. Uh, one of the other things that, that happened was that there was a presidential election happening <laughs> at the same time. And there were about 20 candidates at one point uh, running for, for president on the Democratic side. And all of them were suddenly very in, interested in diversity and finding people of color to hire as everyone was being sucked up into a presidential campaign became particularly difficult. But I also thought a lot about what it was for me as a young person, uh, not always having the opportunity to, to get the jobs that I, that I needed in order to advance. Uh, for one reason or another, it's not being able to, to afford it, um, not being able to position yourself in a place like Washington, D.C., where you're paying enormous rent and not getting paid nearly enough money in order to support yourself. And I didn't come from a family that uh, could float me anywhere other than than being at home. Uh, so I worked at it. I, you know, I, I ended up hiring uh, my campaign manager and I said, look, we, we need a team that, that looks like this district that is able to communicate with this district. By the end of it, I had a mostly woman of color finance team. I had a mostly one, woman of color communications team, a mostly woman of color field team. And so much of the work that everybody brought into it, so many of those different perspectives, I think really propelled us forward in a district that, that worked like mine. But it was really important to me that I didn't just have these faces here on this campaign so that I could feel good about myself. We were really conscientious about cross-training folks so that they would be able to get other jobs following my campaign. We were very conscientious about our fellows program and making sure that there was a, as much of an educational component as possible. I see some of my fellows here on the call. We made an effort to teach them campaign finance and organizing and all of these things that are twofold, right? right? They help folks figure out how to get into the halls of power, whether they be city hall or the halls of Congress. And they help lead to jobs. And right now, as I'm seeing that infrastructure bear fruit, even though I, I didn't win, we got very close, but I didn't win. Uh, you know, one of my fellows, I think Eric Wormuth, he's starting a, uh, a PAC so that he can get young people engaged in, in state assembly races, which is incredible and necessary. Uh, I think Sydney Smith is here. She's working on a city council campaign just south of me in Dallas. And she is working hard to bring about different representation, great representation at the local level. I think I saw Janice, are you here? You might've left. Janice Wastes, uh, she's working with Congressman Lloyd Doggett in Austin. So from my campaign, I'm seeing all of these folks building out this, this infrastructure that we've been lacking for decades. And it's been really, incredibly important for me to continue to build out the work, not just for democratic politics, uh, but for representative government. And it starts at every single uh, hiring and staffing decision that you make. It sounds like you have created an incredible culture on your team. Wow. 
Um, so on the topic of women in work, we know that as women, we are more likely to doubt our capabilities in ways that our male counterparts do not. What advice would you have for fellow ambitious women who don't know when to ask for promotions or to seek out the next step in their career? The thing that you should tell yourself, the thing that I've, I've told, I have to tell myself, the thing that I tell women around me, is, is that you're enough, that you are enough. Women oftentimes think that they need to have two PhDs before even entertaining running for office. They, they feel as though they have to be incredibly, I don't know, they have this vision of themselves in their minds that they needed to be before they could ask for anything that they deserve in life. And sometimes it's a matter of, of just stepping up and asking. And if somebody says no, uh, you have a couple of options. You can ask them to help get you to that point. You know, coaching is something that is real and possible and more people should be doing that to invest in their people. And if you don't feel as though somebody sees the worth of your work, uh, the worth of what you bring to the table, you might need to be looking for different opportunities. These things aren't necessarily linear. Uh, you don't have to have that specific job in order to get to where you need to be in life. You just need to be doing work that you're proud of doing. And for many women, we often put up with a whole lot uh, to get to a, a place that we feel like we need to be. And then one day we hit a certain age and we wonder what would happen with our lives. And one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing coming out of Gen Z is that you are a lot better about understanding what your worth is, but there are going to be a lot of voices who are rooted in very traditional thought processes uh, that are going to try to put you in your place and they're going to be loud and they're going to be frequent. And I hope that you can hold on to that. The, 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 the confidence, don't hold on to what they're saying. <laughs> I know that your campaign has really empowered so many people, even especially in the CMC community, um, to follow politics and to want to volunteer. And like Tori said, your campaign sounded so fantastic to work with. As someone who worked on the Hill, I can say not all campaigns are equal. Um, but I know that so many people are here tonight because they became fans of yours during the campaign. Um, and we know that it's been a very tumultuous couple months for Texas with um, the big storm. And now Texas is reopening, which seems like a very politicized decision. Um, and we've seen that you're using your social media to be all of your social media platforms to provide a voice of reason and calm leadership. Um, you've been fundraising for local organizations. And last week you became the chair of the Texas chair for Vote Mama, a political action committee supporting progressive mothers who are running for office. Can we ask what's next or what your plans are in this role? Um, I know everyone really wants to ask if you're running again, um, but just what your plans are um, for the next couple months. Right now, I'm just focusing on that, that burgeoning democratic infrastructure I'm so in love with. And that means trying to get better people in, in local offices. I'm working hard on municipal races. And, you know, in three weeks when my vaccine finally kicks in, I, I just got shot number two. I, I, I can't wait to be out knocking on doors and, and helping out folks in the community. And what happens beyond that? And I particularly enjoy sharing this with this crowd because you all are wonkish or at least wonkish adjacent. We are looking at redistricting numbers and so much of that de depends on the United States Census. Uh, for those of you who are, are closely following the census, which is mostly nobody, uh, you might know that oftentimes the census is due at the end of the census year. So the 2020 census should have been uh, released to states to use their numbers by December of 2020. That, that date was then moved down to March uh, because of COVID-19 and some decisions made by the Trump administration. And then that date was moved down to September. And so what you're seeing here is a little bit of chaos 
for the state houses that were supposed to redraw the lines in every state in the country. And believe me, reapportionment needs to happen because some, some uh, states are going to be losing members. Uh, some states like Texas is going to be gaining members. So we should be gaining three members here. And finding out September of 2021 for a primary on in March, if not a little bit later, 2022, and then November of 2022 is, is just difficult. I think the state of Ohio is suing the United States Census because they don't have the numbers. I, I don't understand that. I, it reminds me of people who uh, shoot at tornadoes. I guess it sounds like it, they're, they're trying to handle this very big disaster coming at them the best way they know how, but it, it, it's not going to help release those numbers any sooner. Uh, so for me, uh, making a decision to run for office depends very strongly on how severe the gerrymandering is moving forward after, after September and whether or not Congress happens to pass a Voting Rights Act that prevents much of that gerrymandering from occurring. So before this event, uh, the three of us were at a student panel where students were asking you different questions about um, your campaign. And one thing that really spoke out to me was that, or stuck out to me, sorry, was that you spoke about feeling as though now that the campaign is over, you don't have the same platform to channel political frustration into. And I think for so many people, that's been an experience during the pandemic or over the past few years, or just a state of being for so many citizens who don't have political platforms. Uh, so I wanted to know what advice you have for people who are worried about things like gerrymandering or already worried about 2022. Um, what kind of advice you have now that you have experience experience both as a citizen and um, a candidate. As the districts get smaller, they become harder and harder to gerrymander. And there are huge issues that you can address at the local level. So much power, so much strength happens at home. Uh, for instance, when I ran for school board, it was very difficult to explain to folks, okay, this is this is important. Uh, lots of Democrats don't look at these lower offices, and particularly in Texas, it's really dangerous because that leaves a whole bunch of power on the table for only one party. And I don't, I'm not a fan on, of one party rule on, on, on any account. But for me, I didn't just see myself in charge of buying school buses or building facilities. I was also the last stop against uh, civil rights issues when it came to our LGBTQ kids or children of color. I was the only school board member that was challenging my district on uh, the, the racial gaps in our, our test scores. And the achievement gap is just such a huge thing, but not all districts are really thinking about it because they're just thinking about the kids that they understand, the kids that they know. And when you don't have a very diverse governing body, the kids that they know may just be 20% of the district, which happened a lot for me. So when you uh, engage in your local politics, when you're looking at your, your city councils, your water board even, uh, your, when you're looking at your state assembly or your state house districts, there's so much more impact that you can make to make a very, very big difference. And part of why I do the work that I do to help municipal candidates, part of why I was doing the work to raise money for a local nonprofit that does rental assistance and, and uh, does food assistance, is that there are families that have these really immediate needs that can be solved in state and local government. And you can't control what's gonna be happening with gerrymandering, you can't control whether uh, we can get Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema to vote for a Voting Rights Act or get rid of a filibuster, but you can control what you do when you walk outside your house and see what, what needs to be fixed. And, and that's what I'm doing now. Thank you for that. Um, I certainly know that some of my fellow students and I have been feeling a bit disenfranchised or hopeless about politics recently, but just hearing some of the things that you've said today has been really helpful. 
And on that note, we do love to end our episodes on a more uplifting note. Um, so I want to know what gleams of hope are in your periphery right now, or how do you stay inspired in your work? I, I stay inspired a number of ways. I mean, my children, one, my, my, my now two-year-old and five-year-old are always centering me. Um, they're always they always humble me in a lot of different ways. It's very interesting to, uh, you know, come off of, you know, a CNN interview and then go up to your five-year-old who does not care about your CNN interview because he needs to talk to you about Minecraft and you need to listen. It, you're not important enough to not listen. Uh, so that there, that's something that really keeps me going every day and, and thinking about the children that may not necessarily have their parents home with them all the time because they're working very hard uh, or kids like me that had you know difficulties staying in one place um and I, I, it keeps me wanting to to go and work for them and so many people are inspired in the same direction so many more women and women of color are stepping up and running for office uh, so many more folks are deciding that they too have a voice that needs to be heard at the local, state, and federal levels. And I'm absolutely inspired by the CMC student body. Uh, so many of you have persevered in such difficult, insane conditions. So many of you have found yourself in, in, de self in desperate situations or not so desperate situations and still band together in order to advocate for your needs. And it's fantastic to have this incredible education, but if you don't do anything with it, what good is it? And I'm seeing a more active, more engaged, more vocal um, student body than I, I think I remember. And we were pretty vocal, uh, but not, not nearly as unified. Uh, and I think there's something very beautiful about that. Thank you. That is all the time we have for today's episode of Free Food for Thought. Candice, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And a big thank you to those who have tuned in with us live today. The recorded podcast episode will be posted this Friday and can be accessed by finding Free Food for Thought on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or freefoodforthought.com. Now, as we always say to our listeners, remember to stay hungry. I'll hand it back over to Chris for the audience Q&A portion of the talk. Thanks so much to the podcast team and to Candice for uh, taking us through that interview. We're gonna now uh, turn to some of the questions that our audience has written in, starting with a CMC student who asks, from your experiences in the school board, I was wondering if you could speak about uh, your experiences with modern day forms of segregation, including the racial opportunity gap. How did you channel these local issues into your national campaign? Thank you so much for asking that. So when I when I ended up moving from the school board to a, the congressional level or to, to a congressional race, a lot of folks uh, thought, well, you know, this is more of a state's issue. States handle education. But so many of the equity measures, uh, title funding, uh, so the funding that goes to free and reduced lunch, uh, the funding that goes to IDEA kids, uh, so students with disabilities, uh, so many of the rules surrounding uh, whether or not we have equity for our LGBTQ students, for our, our students of color, uh, are, are channeled into the, 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 the uh, federal level. And it's the reason that I was running on a platform of, of affordable childcare and universal pre-K starting at, at age two. Because when you look at early childhood education, uh, kids who start early, uh, kids who have high quality care are more likely to go to college, uh, less likely to experience teen pregnancy, less likely to experience uh, drug abuse. All of these things happen when you have wonderful early childhood education, uh, but not enough folks have been investing in that. And I spent a lot of time during my campaign, not just talking about it as an issue that is good for moms or an issue that's good for children, uh, but an economic issue, an issue that invests in our community and gives us five times the investment back uh, in our workforce, in tax revenue. It does a lot of incredible things when we talk about uh, making universal 
early childhood education uh, a, a part of our, our, our federal conversation. And it's something that I'm going to continue to talk about as I do whatever I do, uh, particularly as the, the, state tech, the Texas State Chair of Vote Mama, um, it is a very big part of our mission. What do you think is the um, biggest challenge facing this current Congress? I think the biggest challenge facing Congress is, is trying to pass the legislation that will get through, that will get help to the American people. And I think that that was something that faced them last session, but it's so much more complicated now when you're thinking about uh, dealing with COVID-19 measures as they have been this year. When you think about what it means to go back to a high pressure workplace in which you might have almost died. And a lot of members are still grappling what, with what happened months ago because it, it, there's no way to get away from it. And I feel strongly about that. I, I, it, it really hurt. I, I think is the best way to put it, to, to see folks who go to work every day to work hard for the public good, many of them, and be in a position in which they, they feared for their lives uh, over what was a hoax. And they still need to continue to do this work regardless of, of how they feel. And the hope is that we get folks vaccinated and we get folks out into the open and we get them into community with people that don't necessarily think like them and we see a decrease in in some of these extremist groups that perpetuate the myths that led to the insurrection and on january 6th and i think that will help uh, congress to be able to better do their jobs moving forward but right now it's just rough Our next question comes in from an alum who wants to know, when did you know that running for office was how you could make the biggest difference on the issues you care about? Interestingly, I, when I was looking at the school board, when I was looking at what it took to uh, provide for the safety and the well-being of kids, when I first looked into running. Uh, the person I ended up running against talked about test, scoring, test, test scores going up after a nearby apartment building was bulldozed. So all of those poor kids from that one apartment building left and suddenly test scores are better. And the glee with which he referred to this was enraging. And it occurred to me that people feel free to speak like that because they don't ever have to see someone as a peer that might have, I don't know, grown up in an apartment, uh, might have grown up with um, fewer resources. Or, you know, other mem board members talked about parents just not caring. These, these, these parents, these kids today, they don't care about their kids as much as we did. And I had to explain to them that the cost of living is different, that the, the wages brought in by a lot of, of middle-class parents and lower middle-class parents and poor parents uh, did not allow them the same latitude uh, to make, uh, make cupcakes for the PTA every Saturday. And it was just the ability to speak to these issues as setting up policies uh, that really compelled me to wanna insert myself in the conversation. And I'm really glad that I did. What advice do you, or what advice would you give to graduating seniors who want to get involved in politics after graduation, but may have some financial constraints? As much as possible, I think you, you should be looking at, at going home, if you can. If that is a resource that is available to you, go home. Uh, try to figure out the work that you need to do in your community. Get behind local candidates that you care about, that you trust. Um, if you don't necessarily feel like local candidates uh, are, are speaking to you, uh, think about working with folks and, and see about maybe becoming that candidate that you do trust, that you do want uh, to be fighting for your family, for your community. 
so many times we think about it. I think I, and I say this because I was that person thinking that there was no way I could really earnestly involve myself in politics without going to, to DC, without getting a very expensive loft in Austin. And all I really needed to do was go home and, and try to engage as much as possible there and try to take so much of the lessons that I learned at CMC uh, to the local level so that uh, we could push for better governance, for, for more thoughtful engagement, because that's something that we desperately need right now. Political decision-making is easiest when your values line up with what's politically popular, but how would you counsel Democrats and the federal government to act, and how have you handled it in your own experience, uh, dealing with those issues where your most closely held values are genuinely unpopular among your constituency? It's an excellent question. As a school board trustee, even though I was in a nonpartisan position, I was basically in the minority. Uh, there were two Democrats on my board, and again, nonpartisan, but we all know, and five other Republicans. And so all of the policies that I wanted to push forward, all of the policies that I wanted to get passed were policies that were rooted in data. Uh, that were rooted in uh, the sense that everybody stood to benefit. Everybody stood to benefit from making sure that we had one-to-one -one devices. Everyone stood to benefit when we put STEM academies and fine arts academies in our elementary schools, even though a lot of those little kids who got a hold of, uh, you know, a marimba for the first time at age six and then played them better than me in high school might never have had that opportunity. It really did fan out to just about everybody in the district. And so finding all of the places where shared values exist is, is one way to approach it. But here's the problem when we go higher up in, in the political sphere. The higher up you go in politics, the more you're not just contending with uh, the sensibilities of public servants. And I'm not even sure I would call a lot of those folks who end up in state and federal, um, uh, state and federal places of power servants, really. You deal with money, and large amounts of money can really affect the narrative, can really affect the negotiating power that you have when you're trying to represent people and the other person is trying to represent maybe one or two donors. And it's one of the reasons that I'm such a big advocate for campaign finance reform, because until that happens, until we deal with money in politics being as influential as it is, then you're not going to be able to have somebody who's going to come to the table to serve people. And ultimately, I don't have any other purpose in the pursuit of, of elected office other than to serve people, because quite frankly, this is a grueling job. I do not have the ego to sustain it. I, I do not enjoy, I, as much as I love enjoy, I, I love uh, talking to CMC uh, graduates and alumni and parents. I, I don't necessarily need to be on CNN every other week. It's fine. I, you know, they don't, people don't need another person talking at them, but we do need people that are speaking to the issues of the American people that are pushing to change policies that are pushing to make a difference. And as long as I hold those values close to my heart, as long as I am constantly reminded of the people that need voices, I'll keep fighting the good fight. Um, kind of going off of that, as someone in a more public position running for office, I'm sure you get a lot of personal attacks. How do you respond to or handle those attacks? If it's something that's worth addressing, I address it. And, and, that's, and, that, and that's really critical, right? So talking about your policies, if somebody is lying about your policies, if somebody is lying about your qualifications, then it's something that you should probably talk to. But sometimes there is no way of really fighting with people. And that just means lots and lots of cardio. And that's, that's really the only way to deal with it. You're going to have haters. You're going to have people harassing you. And as a young woman of color, I was told a lot of really horrific things about me, including that I shouldn't consider running for office with children. Uh, somebody likened me to a very old slur. I think I was called a welfare queen. Uh, 
lots of lots of horrific things that came from sources that I would never have expected uh, to provide the amount of harassment and criticism that I got, uh, including a classmate of mine. And that was incredibly hurtful. But I worked hard to keep my purpose in mind. I worked hard to keep the people who weren't on Twitter or on Facebook or on Fox News in the, in the back of my mind with everything that I did because those were the people that needed me far more uh, than the people who were trying to snipe me down. Do you have any political heroes and whose path do you really admire or possibly hope to emulate in some way? I, I love Shirley Chisholm. I, I think that her no nonsense way of communicating was absolutely amazing. That I love that her policies were very much steeped in making sure that everybody had a fair shot. And she's, she's a teacher and she just sounded like uh, the teacher that everybody needed and wanted in their lives. And I'm sad that she never had a chance to become president. Uh, I love Barbara Jordan, who was the first African-American member of Congress out of Texas. Um, and she was also very much uh, a product of, of, of Texan values and, and wanting to work hard to make this uh, America that, that fulfills its promise, as Barbara says. And in a more modern context, Katie Porter, uh, Deb Holland, Ayanna Presley, so much of their politics come, starts with their community in mind and then moves outward. Uh, as a candidate personally, I was not one that bought into catchphrases in a lot of different senses, but I was bought into the best policies that worked for uh, the families in my, in my district. And I think that that level of, of investment in just those people and those families and making a difference for them uh, comes out in the work of, of Congresswoman Holland, of Congresswoman Porter, who is just incredible, and, and Congresswoman Presley, who never, never stops inspiring with everything that she says. Well, thank you so much. Before we wrap things up, do you have any concluding thoughts for the audience? Just that you have had one of the most challenging years in modern memory. And I am so grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you. I am so proud of the work that you've put into yourselves in this time, the work that you've put into your, 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 your lives and your careers. And I hope that as you move forward, as you go back to campus, you bear in mind your time at home. And I hope that you make time to come back home uh, during the course of, of your time in school, because it is so important that if you do desire to work on the Hill, if you do desire to um, be a, a part of any level of government, uh, that you understand what your community is experiencing. So maybe volunteer. Uh, I know many of you volunteered so that you could check off a box in order to get into college, but maybe this time go and volunteer with the purpose of, of getting to know people that don't think like you, that haven't had an experience like you have. Um, make the op take the opportunity to uh, talk to folks around your community that may not necessarily have access to the education that you have. It is really important moving forward as a country that we learn to listen to each other. And as CMC students, you're uniquely talented uh, and uniquely positioned to do a lot of great things. So I hope that you'll work to lift the community up with you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Canvas Valenzuela and to all those who sent in questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual app event, which will be on Wednesday, March 31st at 5 p.m. Pacific. History professor Amanda Urich will discuss how the practice of polemic in the Protestant Reformation polarized public discourse in civic society. Thank you and have a good evening.